All right, so on my palette, I've got laid, laid out uh, a little bit of pretty much every color that I have in my in my uh, painting kit. Now, I have some more paint in here than you would normally have in your painting kit that I haven't laid out. I'm not putting out my cadmium orange or my purple. In this context, I don't really need it, but good practice is basically in your kits, if you have a color or two of paint, you want a little bit of each one represented on your palette, even if you're working in grayscale or you don't know that you'll need it. The reason for that is we're inherently kind of lazy painters. And so if we need cadmium yellow light, but it's not out here, we're gonna try and fuss around it and kind of use maybe um, like a cadmium medium or maybe just try and avoid it altogether. And if it's out here, you're more likely to experiment with it and use it. You will not run out of paint in this class. I highly doubt it. If you do, I will buy you your tube of paint. Um, so within bounds of reason, you squeeze out your tube of paint, we got a problem. But, um, you know, you won't run out of paint. So leave it out. The other thing is it doesn't dry white right away. So you can come back to this between sessions and work. So in my paint jar, I've got Gamsol. And I've just kind of soaked my brush. Uh, and I'm gonna wipe a little bit out with a paint rag. Make sure you have a rag at the ready. And what we're gonna do is start by kind of mixing like a, a, a sort of neutral, kind of deep gray, maybe not black, which, but all of you should have been well versed in making this sort of black tone. Generally speaking, to get there, a little bit of ultramarine, a little bit of burnt umber, touch of red, little yellow, is gonna get us fairly close. And again, it doesn't have to be precise because we're not going for jet black, but we do wanna have a dark neutral tone. And so once you have that laid out, you'll notice it's really thin and watery, almost like I'm working with watercolors. And that's what we want to start. We wanna work fat over lean. And so that means our first layers are going to be lean. We wanna strip some of the oil out of the oil paint so it dries quickly. And the other thing that happens is when you do that, um, oil paint, when you pull the oil out of it is less, uh, it becomes more brittle. And so if you're building layers and you put a top layer, that doesn't have any oil in it, it's likely to crack and dry out. And so we want our base layers to be stripped of oil because they're gonna be covered up by these rich oil-based layers and because it'll dry quickly. So it's for the preservation of the painting, it's for the uh, function of painting in general. As you paint, the paint's gonna bind better to itself when we work with more oil-based layers as we go. Uh, and long-term it won't crack. So there's a lot of reasons we start with a really lean base layer. And so once I've got this laid out, uh, you'll notice I still have some white and I'm gonna work this back in. So you're gonna see me sort of toggle back and forth between here and my painting. All right, so right now I've got like a kind of loosely sketched still life outlined on my panel. It's nothing fancy. Uh, it's really just a line drawing. And as I said, I've left some of the ghost lines. Uh, just for reference. And so now what I'm gonna work on is starting to block in some value. And so I've got my still life right in front of me and I'm gonna start working on using a lot of Gamsol. You can see it's kind of runny, it's very fluid. Sketching in a value structure. And this is kind of, you know, if you think back to the no tan drawings that you were working on, it's sort of similar to that, but with a little bit more detail, we're just trying to block in and think about what our value range is gonna be. If it gets away from you, what's really nice about these rags is they function as a, a painting tool as much as they do, uh, you know, a method of cleaning out your brushes. And so it's very forgiving. Right now I'm working on panel, but. Uh, you'll have a very similar response if you're working on a uh, canvas to being able to wipe things out. And so again, I'm using a lot, lot, lot of Gamsol. And I'm using a uh, bristle brush. So make sure that you start your paintings off with the bristle brush. If you don't do that, it's uh, gonna be really hard on your sable and tacklon brushes. Tacklon brushes are a little bit more sturdy uh, compared to a sable brush, but the hog bristle brushes are really meant for covering a lot of ground quickly. And so you'll see I'm not laboring over this. I'm just trying to kind of map out 
value structure and think about where my darks and my lights are and what my warms and my cools are going to be and the areas that are highlighted by a, a typical light source they might be a little bit warmer and so maybe to help bring out the highlight i might have just like a little bit of yellow worked in there uh, Now, this is only one method of starting an underpainting. There are a lot of different ways that we're gonna kind of explore and play around with this. Our next assignment, we're gonna do a complementary color underpainting. More often than not, I prefer doing an underpainting in like a burnt umber or burnt sienna and working in my warms and cools, but it's really, some of it's just preference and, and kind of gears towards the effect that you're trying to create. Here we're just working in grayscale as a nice point of departure from your drawing class, which is what you're most familiar with, unless you've been painting avidly. And one thing I'm a very big proponent of is mixing your colors on the canvas and so you can see i'm working wet into wet i'm kind of sketching in some darker values right on the panel now you are going to do some color mixing you know on the palette i mixed my my kind of neutral gray and black tones there but but by mixing on the canvas you learn how the colors fuse together a lot better and colors relative to its context so you're not really going to know what a color truly looks like on the painting until you've actually applied it. What looks like a vibrant red might be really muted once you apply it to your canvas. And so what we're working towards is building our value structure and keeping it kind of fluid and sketchy and using warms and cools as, as needed to help kind of bring out form. You'll notice I'm holding my paintbrush really far back. Uh, just like in drawing class, I'm a stickler for keeping distance from your painting. And so re one of the reasons we have this long handled brush is it allows us to distance ourselves from the image. It also gives us more control than we might you might uh, think. By standing farther back, we're engaging our whole arm and we're able to get more diverse marks. We have a greater range because our shoulders engage than if we're just using our wrist. So we're seeing the image as a whole, we can better see what's uh, out of place, if, if anything, and we can have more confident brushwork. What you don't wanna do when you're underpainting is labor and kind of blend and try and lose all of your brushwork. Uh, you know, there's a place for that, but not when we're first starting out. We're just trying to build structure and these directional marks are gonna help establish form in the same ways that a value range will. So don't paint out your brushwork. Again, if it gets away from you or you realize you got too dark, feel free to go with your rag and just lift out. It's not gonna come off all the way. Uh, a little bit of Gamsol on your rag will definitely lift out more, but it doesn't have to be perfect. We're gonna paint over this. This is just like the first layer. So it's practice. So I'm gonna keep mapping this out for a little bit. Um, and starting to build value structure. One thing to, to uh, be mindful of that I see students do a lot is avoiding the background. And the background is really important. If you've taken like an intro to design class, you've probably heard your teacher talk a lot about figure ground relationships and positive and negative space. Uh, negative space is just as important as positive space. And so the negative space in this image is really the stuff that's not the focal point. These objects are considered positive, they're the form, and the surrounding area would be considered negative, but it's framing these objects. So we wanna be attentive to it. The other reason we wanna be attentive to it is I'm painting white on white. And so if I leave this painting and my highlight is a bright white highlight against an even whiter canvas, well, I'm not gonna have contrast and it's not gonna stand out. So I would encourage going in with like a big brush. I've got a pretty fat uh, 
bristle brush and going in and doing a wash thinking about warms and cools it doesn't have to be perfect I wouldn't make it black but thinking about okay I have a really light object against perhaps a really dark background so maybe I want a darker background to help push these objects forward and because I've got a lot of warm tones on this side I might put a little bit of cooler colors in the background just to help add that contrast Again, you don't have to do that. You might decide warm on warm is what you want. Uh, but these are strategies that can just help give you form without having to reinvent the wheel. It's a pretty quick, I don't wanna say it's a freebie, but it is like easy points. And so notice I can get it in there really quickly. Use the big paintbrush, it is your friend. Uh, and if things start to run or drip or they get too dark, you know, use your rag, lift it out. And it's going to stain the canvas or the panel. And so you're going to have something down that you can then uh, begin to respond to. I might decide, you know, this side is a little bit lighter. Maybe I want a little bit more contrast on this side and work a little bit of dark in. But so it's a push and pull. What you don't want to do is you don't want to develop one area of a painting at a time. So you'll notice I kind of blocked this in. I haven't addressed the handle yet. I've started to address this fear. I haven't addressed... Uh, the little box in the corner. I'm really moving around. And the reason for that is in the same way that we talk about color being relative to its context, a painting and objects in it are the same way. We want to have all of the pieces come together as a whole, sort of at the same time as much as possible, because you might paint a perfect sphere, but if you find out that it's too dark in contrast to the, the vase that you paint afterwards, you have to redo it. So by working back and forth, you're seeing a more holistic come together of the painting. In that sense, it's a very, uh, it's almost like a conversation or a dialogue. You're not going to forecast and telegraph each move. You're going to work a little bit here, work a little bit there, and allow uh, the image to come together as a whole. And what's nice about this is once it's done, this will be dry and ready for a new layer of paint uh, pretty quickly. I could probably get, depending on what the weather is doing and how dry it is outside, the gamsol is going to evaporate and I'll be able to start painting over the top of this, probably even later tonight if I wanted to. So. This allows you to get things sketched out. The other thing is because it's such a thin tint, if I hate it and I need to start over or gesso over it, I can do that and I, it's, you know, no harm, no foul. And again, we're not choking our paintbrush. We're not trying to be super precise. We're playing, we're having fun. And we're going to trust that this image is going to do what she needs to do. And if she doesn't, well, if she gets away from you, if you really hate it, that's why we are meeting in class and I can help work you through whatever those sort of challenge areas might be. The other thing to keep in mind, in the same way that I say focus on the background, think about the surface of the table. What's really going to help anchor these objects is those cast shadows that have begun to block in. They're really crucial to establishing form. And so don't ignore them. As soon as you place them in, they're going to tell you whether or not what you're doing is working. They're also going to help kind of uh, give you a sense of if your perspective, if your uh, scale and proportions are working. So don't, don't avoid the cast shadows. They are your friends. All right, so I'm gonna keep working on this and then uh, once she's set up, 
Uh, and I've got my value range mapped throughout. I'll let her dry and then we'll talk about adding that next layer.